All right, this is video lecture number 58. Today we are talking about uh, how labor got organized. For our subsections, we are looking at the emergence of a labor movement. Uh, we're going to look at a group called the Knights of Labor, and then Farmers and Workers, the Cooperative Alliance, and then another path, the American Federation of Labor. <clears throat> so when Thomas B. McGuire, a wagon driver, uh, told the Senate committee in 1883 that he had once hoped to become something of a capitalist eventually, he gave plaintive voice to an aspiration of many working class Americans. McGuire had found it impossible to succeed as an independent cab driver. Economic change had reduced opportunities among those who viewed themselves as the heirs of the self-employed of an earlier America. Labor unrest grew on the farm and in the factory during the 1870s and 1880s, and a group called the Knights of Labor were the initial beneficiary. Uh, under the leadership of Terence V. Powderly, uh, the Knights were an urban version of the Grange, uh, combining the social activities with group action. Beset by various problems, the group was in fatal decline, however, by, by the 1890s. Uh, in its place, the American Federation of Labor, which brought together pure and simple trade unions, emerged as the nation's preeminent labor organization. Meanwhile, uh, some workers turned to more radical movements, socialism or anarchism, uh, the latter a factor in the Haymarket Square riot in Chicago during 1886. Trade unionism accepted capitalism, but socialism did not. Uh, the defeat of the American Railway Union in the strike and boycott against the Pullman Palace Car Company helped turn the union's leader, Eugene V. Debs, into a socialist. Um, so this provides insight into uh, management's position, not only in the Pullman crisis, but in other activities concerning labor across the country as well. So let's have a look at the first section then, the emergence of a labor movement. Labor advocates could adopt one of two strategies. First, they could seek to build broad political alliances, reaching out to rural voters who shared their problems or were sympathetic to their cause. Second, uh, they could reject politics and create more narrowly focused trade unions that negotiated directly with employers. In general, labor advocates emphasized the first strategy uh, between the 1870s and early 1890s and the second strategy in the early 20th century. Across this era, uh, while industrialization made America an increasingly rich and powerful nation, um, it also brought large-scale conflict between labor and capital. The problem of industrial labor entered Americans' consciousness dramatically with the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. Uh, protesting steep wage cuts during the Depression, thousands of railroad workers walked off the job. For their role in the strike, many railroad uh, workers were fired and blacklisted. Uh, railroad companies circulated their names on a do not hire list to prevent them from getting any work in the industry. That's what blacklisting means. Um, in the post-Civil War decades, many rural people saw themselves as sharing the same enemies as industrial workers. Um, agrarians, or farmers advocates, argued that high tariffs forced rural families to pay more for basic necessities while failing to protect America's great export crops, uh, cotton, and wheat. Now, the most prominent agrarian protest group of the early post-war decades was the National Grange of the Patrons of Husbandry, founded in 1867. Uh, like working men, Grange farmers sought to counter the new power of corporate middlemen uh, through cooperation and through mutual aid. In the wake of the 1870s depression, Grangers, uh, labor advocates, and local working men's parties forged a new national political movement called the Greenback Labor Party. Overall, uh, greenbackers, as they were called, uh, subscribed to the ideal of producerism. They dismissed middlemen, uh, bankers, lawyers, and investors as idlers uh, who lived off the sweat of those who labored with their hands. Believing that these producers shared common goals, they sought to unite them as a political force. In 1878, 
Uh, Greenback Labor candidates won over a million votes, uh, and the party elected 15 congressmen. By the early 1880s, 29 states had created uh, something called railroad commissions to supervise railroad rates and policies. Others formed commissions to regulate insurance and utility companies. By 1890, 21 states had antitrust laws to prevent monopolies. These early regulatory efforts were not always effective, uh, but they were important in, uh, in terms of getting a starting point for reform. All right, so let's look at this group, the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor was founded in 1869 as a secret society of garment workers in Philadelphia. Uh, and by 1878, they had emerged as a national movement. The Knights had originally intended to set up a cooperative commonwealth of factories owned and run by the employees. Uh, they were led by a man named Terence V. Powderly. Uh, they also advocated temperance. In the early 1880s, the Knights began to act more like trade unions. Uh, as the Knights won more strikes, its membership rapidly increased. The Knights favored an eight-hour workday uh, because workers had duties to perform as American citizens, and unionists favored it because it spread the work among more people, providing more jobs and protecting them from overwork. As the union deadline for achieving the eight-hour workday approached, workers responded with a wave of strikes and demonstrations, the most infamous of these uh, being the Haymarket Square incident, uh, which was blamed on anarchists who advocated a stateless society. Chicago was a hotbed of anarchism. Uh, four of the anarchists were executed, one committed suicide, and the others received long prison sentences. Now, seizing on the anti-union hysteria set off by the Haymarket Affair, uh, employers broke strikes violently, compiled blacklists, and forced some workers to sign yellow dog contracts that renounced union membership. All right, so let's look at the farmers. Farmers and workers, the Cooperative Alliance. Despite the Haymarket Uprising, the Knights' cooperative vision did not entirely fade. A new rural movement, the Farmers' Alliance, arose uh, to take up some of the issues that Grangers and Greenbackers had earlier sought to address. Founded in Texas during the Depression of the 1870s, uh, the Alliance spread across the Plains and the South, becoming by the late 1880s the largest farmer-based movement uh, in American history. Alliance leaders pinned their initial hopes on cooperative stores and exchanges um, that would circumvent middlemen. Cooperatives gathered farmers' orders and bought in bulk at wholesale prices and they passed the savings on to the farmers so they could buy whatever they needed to farm. Alliance cooperatives suffered, however, from chronic underfunding and lack of credit. Uh, and they also faced hostility from merchants and lenders that they tried to circumvent. When cotton prices fell further in 1891, however, the Texas Exchange fell. The Texas Alliance then proposed a sub-treasury system modeled on the national banking system. Under the sub-treasury plan, the federal government would hold crops in public warehouses and issue loans on their value until they could be profitably sold. Expanding on the earlier work of the Grange uh, and carrying it to the south and to the west, the Farmers Alliance cooperated with the Knights of Labor, uh, using rural reformers' substantial political clout on behalf of urban workers who shared their political vision. In 1887, Congress sent President Grover Cleveland uh, two groundbreaking bills that he did sign into law. Uh, the first is the Hatch Act. Uh, it provided federal funding for agricultural research and education, directly meeting farmers' demands for government support of agriculture. Um, also, the landmark Interstate Commerce Act was a direct response to pressure from farmer labor constituents. The ICC represented a compromise between farmer labor advocates and other reformers 
who were more sympathetic to business. The Interstate Commerce Commission, again, faced formidable challenges. Uh, though the new law forbade railroads from reaching secret rate-setting agreements, uh, evidence was very difficult to gather. Um, secret pooling continued. At the same time, the Supreme Court eroded the Commission's powers. So on to the next section, another path, the American Federation of Labor. While the Knights of Labor got involved in politics, some skilled workers pursued a different strategy. In the 1870s, printers, molders, iron workers, bricklayers, and about 30 other groups of skilled workers organized trade unions nationwide. These brotherhoods focused in more narrow and specific ways on the everyday needs of workers in skilled occupations. Trade unions saw a closed shop with all jobs reserved for union members. Uh, that kept out lower wage workers. Union rules specified the terms of work, sometimes in minute detail. For a while, in the 1880s, many trade unionists joined the Knights of Labor Coalition, uh, but the catastrophe of Haymarket uh, persuaded them to leave the order and create the separate American Federation of Labor. Samuel Gompers led the ideological assault on the Knights, uh, and he hammered out the philosophical position known as pure and simple unionism, which focused on concrete, achievable gains um, and organizing workers according to their craft and occupation. Gompers led the new AFL until 1924, becoming a towering figure in the labor movement. On one level, pure and simple unionism worked. Uh, the AFL was small at first, uh, but between 1897 and 1904, its membership rose from 447,000 to over 2 million. In the early 20th century, it became the nation's leading voice for workers, lasting far longer than movements like the Knights of Labor. The AFL was far less welcoming to women and blacks, uh, and it was limited mostly to skilled craftsmen. There was little room in the AFL for department store clerks and other service workers, much less the farm workers and domestic servants whom the Knights of Labor had organized. Despite the AFL's great success among these skilled craftsmen, the narrowness of its base was a flaw uh, that would later come back to haunt the labor movement. Okay, so at this time, Go ahead and answer those review questions at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this does conclude today's video lecture um, and continue on with your notes and your work.